So I became a Christian um, in my teens, first of all, in the Cook Islands. Uh, I didn't grow up in a Christian home, so there's a kind of roughness about me, I think, that still exists because I spent most of my life cultivating sin up to the age of 24. But I did become a Christian at 13, thanks to a person in a school sharing their faith with me. A friend took me along to a class, um, an after-school club, sorry, and the gospel was shared to me by a man called Brian Chitty. And he shared the gospel with me. I gave my heart to Jesus and I went home and I experienced persecution. Nothing like a Chinese would experience uh, in that. No one put me in prison, but my parents were very angry because my dad was very, very fiercely opposed to Christianity in those early days. But anyway, I became a Christian uh, and then I went through a really difficult time with my family and I said, Lord, when I leave home, I'll follow you. And the Lord was true to that prayer. And uh, so when I became came into my 20s and I left home, my life started to, I was a very successful young sportsman and, and I was a young school teacher and I was doing really well in my life but there was this deep something missing in my life, there was something I needed and uh, eventually one day, I, I was in the middle of the night watching rugby, uh, not watching rugby, um, I was listening to some music and I'd had one or two um, of those things that I used to drink a lot of and I suddenly realised it was God and that was the start of my journey where I realised God was calling me. Um, so no one was involved in my I suppose reconversion, I like to say I became a Christian at 13 when the seed of the gospel was planted in my heart and that's important for today's message because that's what we're doing when we share the gospel. We're planting a seed that may come to a fruition years later and it might have only been one word we said but that's enough. So I had one encounter at an after school club and that led to me becoming a Christian later on. So anyway, I became a disciple at 24. I remember actually I was about the third seat back on the night where I gave my heart to Jesus. I actually jumped the pew. I didn't know you weren't meant to do that. So when they had an altar call at the end, I jumped the pews to get up the front. And this was in a Presbyterian church, which is even more remarkable. I think I'm probably the only person who became a Christian in the Presbyterian church jumping the pews. But the beautiful thing was when I gave my life to Jesus, my then girlfriend Emma was beside me. I looked to my right and she'd come forward as well and she'd given her heart. So we've been on a journey ever since. Uh, She's a Presbyterian minister and she's preaching this morning, otherwise she'd be here. Uh, And she, she loves Jesus as much as I do. So... That's kind of a bit about me, oh, and I work at Laidlaw now. I'm a Laidlaw lecturer, and I teach the New Testament there, and I, I hate stuffy academia. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of more of, a, a I think, a, a preacher than I am an academic, but somehow or other I made my way through a PhD, and I like writing stuff, so I can find a place in that world. Because if you're studying the Word of God and it's not producing something, then it's a waste of time, isn't it? So today I want to talk about uh, evangelism. And of course, the problem with evangelism is that we've heard a lot about it over the years and many of us, uh, it connotes sort of, for some of us, a bit of guilt. For some of us, it connotes a little bit of fear. For some of us, it's not again. But I think that actually there are ways for us to rethink evangelism in the contemporary climate and bring it alive again and make sense of it. Evangelism is something that the church has been given. It's our gift. We're to share what we have with the world. We've often been taught to evangelize by very good evangelists who know how to write tracts and give them out and these sort of things. And when we get into the real life of engaging with people in our workplaces and in our families, often that just doesn't work. It has the opposite effect. So I think that we need to think a lot more about how we do it. And there's a lot of thinking going on around the world, in the Western world, now that Christianity is no longer dominant, leading people in different directions in this regard. So I, I've come up with this idea called jazz evangelism. Is there anyone that actually likes jazz here today? Good, so a few of you like jazz. Well, that's good. If you don't like jazz, you can replace it with uh, rugby or something or, or, or um, another form of music like classical music. You can, you can replace it with anything. Um, yeah, like you can use another metaphor, so to speak. So where are we? Are we up to date there? Good. Okay. So you can replace it with playing music by ear. So the idea that I've come up with or to describe evangelism is that first of all, you learn the music of the gospel, okay? So there's a guy with learning to play by ear, but before he learned to play by ear, he had to learn music. Any musicians apart from you lovely musicians there? We got, right, so you all learned music, didn't you? You had to sit down and it was, it was a pretty painful experience in those early years, right? Some of you learned music to a higher degree and some of you learned it to some degree and that's what Christians are like. We, we can learn the music of the gospel to varying degrees. What I mean by the music of the gospel is we learn what the gospel is 
And we understand it so deeply in our souls that we can get into a position where we can learn to play music in the moment. There's other people playing. Whenever we encounter someone, God is playing. The Holy Spirit is present and the Holy Spirit is the evangelist. No Christian can convert another Christian. It's implausible. Only God can save a person. So I'm saved because God reached through the words of my friend Brian and cut into my heart and placed the seed there. Satan tried to pick that seed off in the parable of the sower, but he didn't succeed. And later on, the spirit brought that to life and I became the man that I am now. So we learn to play in the moment. There's also the music coming from the other person because the other person is also a person who's spiritual. They may or may not know that they're spiritual, but they are. It's astonishing how many New Zealanders are spiritual. In the recent census, there weren't that many atheists. I think it was in the 7,000s. That means nearly 4.5 million people in New Zealand, which is still almost all New Zealanders, believe in something. They know there's something out there, which is incredible. Because you'd have thought the way that the world speaks that there's no gods and no one believes in God. Well, actually, most New Zealanders believe in something. They just no longer think it's necessarily Jesus. That's the shift. And so what you have is you have people using crystals and astrology and, I mean, I've got family members like this and they're just into all sorts of spiritual stuff, but they haven't been able to connect that to Jesus. So what I'm talking about here is as we learn to engage with people and, or relearn how to engage with people, we learn to be incredible listeners. A really good musician in jazz is really, really sinking in with what's going around them. There's a drummer doing all sorts of little riffs, there's a bass player, there's a sax player, there's a guitarist, there's all these people and they're moving in and out and, they all, and, and the better they get at it, the more they know when one would ad lib and the others would hold back and, the, and, and someone would come forward. And, and that's the other thing about evangelism is it can't be done alone. And I know this is a, 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 the beating heart of Anthony having talked to him a bit about this is that the community itself is the evangelizer on God's behalf. So your interpersonal relationships, what's, what music are you playing as you are together inviting people into your midst to experience God through you as well becomes just as important. So we learn to play by ear in the moment. And we're playing with the music of God and the people we're engaging with. So today I just wanna talk about the music of the gospel. That's one way of remembering it, okay? In December, I'm coming back to do three weeks. I think, oh, here we go. Yeah, in December, I'm coming back to do three weeks and hopefully um, I can build on today. Um, and you'll remember this idea of jazz evangelism. I mentioned cricket, you can talk about a cricketer. Those of you who like cricket, I know some of you have just dropped off, that's fine, I know you're tired. But a good cricketer is someone who learns to really bat. I can remember spending hours with a golf ball, throwing it against the end of my garage, learning to play a forward defense, learning to play a backward defense and all this. And then as you get into cricket, you become better and better at ad-libbing. So then you get a, a guy that New Zealanders love, like Steve Smith, who's an Australian cricketer who can play the most ridiculous cricket shots because he knows he's learnt the music of playing cricket. Now, we can apply this to anywhere in life. So let's talk about the music of the gospel. Now, there's, there's different ways you can do this. Today, I'm going to go in a different direction. There's a book that I've written, which is sitting down the back, which you're welcome to get a copy of, which looks at it from one alternative, and that's where I talk about the five R's of the gospel. By the way, there's a hundred ways of telling the story of the gospel. And that's what I mean about learning the music of the gospel, learning the different ways we can play this gift we've been given by God, which is the Bible story. By the way, this is the gospel. This is the story. And behind that is the actual gospel, Jesus. He's the word, but he's given us this word. And that's why if there's one thing you do a lot of as a Christian, it's reading this. Just dig in, read, read, study, take notes, learn, learn, learn. And the Holy Spirit will take what he... What, what's, what you learn there and put it in you and bring it to life. Basically, uh, that was the best thing I was told as a young Christian. Learn it, memorize it. There's some verses in Psalm 119 about eating it, digesting it. You can't get enough of it. And it doesn't have to be, you don't have to be an advanced scholar. I mean, someone like me, I've been able to go in and dig into all the biblical languages and now God can use me with that. You don't have to be that. Not all of us get that time and privilege. Not all of us can but dig in and know it well. So 
I've got some tracts as well. You're welcome. I'm leaving you a box of them. They're, they're yours to use in the church if you want them. If they're no use to you, then I'm sure you can find another use to them. But yeah, so if you want a copy of that, that will tell you another way of doing the gospel. But today I want to talk about the gospel in this construct, the yes, no of the gospel. So let's start by reading this passage of scripture in 2 Corinthians 1. So if you've got your Bibles, we're just going to read a few verses. As surely as God is faithful... Our word to you has not been yes and no, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, Silvanus, Timothy, and I, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. For in him, every one of God's promises is a yes. For this reason, it is through him that we say the amen to the glory of God. So this is my translation here. Faithful is God. In Greek, that word is first, which means that's the point. God is faithful. Faithful is God. So that our word to you is not yes and no, for in the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who has been proclaimed by us, and that's the team that went there, and you can read about that uh, in Acts chapter 18, when they went to Corinth, has not been yes and no, but yes has come to be in him. What this is telling us is that Jesus is God's yes to the world. Everything that God promises before and since to his people is a yes in him. Any promises of God come to your mind? Call them out. What are some of the promises of God? Restoring the world. God is going to restore the cosmos. There's more than that. I will never leave or forsake you. Absolutely, I will be with you always. Right now, that means God is with you. Isn't that neat? So you can handle it. Whatever it is, you can handle it. What else? Power. In what sense, Terry? Yes. He has, his power is with us in every given situation. Our job is to get into sync with the music of what God's doing in that moment. And God will move in that power. Which is another way of saying, I think what you were saying about God is with us. What about the resurrection? What about Jesus has dealt with your sin? What about you're gonna suffer, but he's with you? Because we're all gonna get old. There's no, there's, no, there's no two ways about that. The pattern of the cross is the human pattern. We're all going to get old. We're all going to die. That's, some of us will die without getting old. But we're going to suffer. But that shouldn't lead us to anxiety. That should lead us to joy because we suffer with God, in God, by the power of Jesus. Anyway, so all these things and more are yes in him. For as many as are the promises of God, we could talk for hours about the promises of God. It might be something you want to do and you know, is to go home and actually think, what are the promises of God? In him, Christ, they are yes. Therefore, through him is the amen to the glory of God. What Paul here is, is answering is, and we won't go into the details here, 2 Corinthians, is he's being criticized for changing his mind. So he's going to the gospel to explain that, hey, when I came, I said, yes, and I, I did change my mind. That's because God told me to do something different. He didn't come when he was expected. So anyway, I've come up with this idea of understanding the Christian story, the music of the gospel. It's very simple. So I'm going to take you through it now. So the first word is yes. Can you say that for me? Yes. Oh, well done. You answered the question as well. Yes, you did. This for me, takes us back to the start of the story. There was a time when God, the earth did not exist except in his mind. And God decided at some point, and we don't know how God's mind works because he's so brilliant, decided to create. And to create this world. And because we know God is omniscient, which means he knows everything, he did it with us in mind then. So at the dawn of, pre-dawn of time, the magic of the universe, as Lewis might say, God decided to create. God didn't have to. God is completely without need. He is completely self-sufficient, Father, Son, and Spirit. He never had to do that, but he chose to. And in so doing, he said yes to us because he was bringing forth us into the world. What a thought. 
that you were in the mind of God way back then. There's mysteries here, aren't there? How could that be? We go, oh, how could that be? Does that mean my whole life is determined and things like this? Well, let's leave that aside because I think it's possible for a life not to be determined but God to do that in the sense that you still make your choices within this God who created. Think of creation. Think of your favorite place in nature that you like. It might be your garden. It might be the beach. It might be a mountain. It might be a river. Think of that. And that is how much God loves us. So God said yes when he created this world. He said yes knowing we would rebel against him, but he still did it because God wants relationship. The purpose of the whole thing, and in my other construct I talk about relationship, the purpose is that at the end of time when the restoration of all things, there will be a group of people who will be added to God's community for all of time. And that's us. All we have to do is respond correctly to this gospel. And of course, in the middle of the garden, uh, God placed humankind in his image. So he not only said yes to us, he said yes to making us beings who are like God in so many ways. And we could unpack that theologically. Some of those things are that we're created to love. We're created with creative skills and artistic skills. We're created individually to express God's being in the multitude of ways that we do. None of us is God but we image him on earth. This is a royal idea of us as God's sons and daughters who are children of the king, given that opportunity to live. And so you have Adam and Eve created in his image in the garden. But the second word in the gospel is no. Yes, no. Say that with me. Say say yes. Yes, no. Yes, no. Yeah, that's right. No. Adam and Eve, of course, we know the story well. They said no to God's one law he gave them. Well, he'd already given one law, and that was to go and fill the earth. But he said, don't eat from that tree. And they did eat from the tree, and they were expelled from the garden. Now, we know that story well. But that also applies to us. Romans 5.12 says that sin entered the world through Adam uh, and came to us because we all sinned. So we participate in that. And all of us are guilty before God of these things that we've done that don't please him. There's a rebellious streak in all of us, isn't there? So you have this gospel that starts with yes and starts with no. There's some images there, the the killing fields in Cambodia, nuclear holocaust and Adam and Eve. These are are symbols. We, We could put thousands of pictures up. If you watch the news, and I really do recommend to you not just to watch TV3, Uh, and Television One News in New Zealand, which gives you such a small view of the world. You know, look look more broadly and hear what God's doing in the world. You'll never hear about the Chinese church, for example, through the media channels that we have. Let's, Let's be people who really listen to what God's doing in the world, but also seeing what's going on in the world. So we said no to him. So God acted. God acted by bringing forth Jesus It's interesting, and this is not something that I would recommend to any of my Greek students, so Carlos and Anthony, but I am interested that the word Yesu sounds like yes to us in English. Now, it doesn't mean that, but it does mean uh, God saves. Yesu, God is Jesus, and as Paul says in this passage, all of God's promises come home in Jesus to the world. Jesus is a postcard or an email or whatever you want to call him to planet Earth, from God declaring to the world that despite the fact that you've said no to me, I'm saying yes to you. My plan was never to leave you abandoned because I was gonna save you, those of you who have ears to hear and eyes to see what I'm doing on the earth. So God sent his son Jesus, and of course we've celebrated Jesus as we took communion, that he died on a cross for our sin, and he in some way through that, and his blood was shed, becomes the ultimate sacrifice for sin to deal with sin for all time. In Israel, they had the Day of Atonement where they sent the goat out into the wilderness and sacrificed animals on that day for the sins of the people. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Day of Atonement. He has come and atoned, covered up, dealt with forever the sins of the world. And because of that, we are justified before God if we believe in him. We are reconciled in relationship to God and we're swept up into relationship with one another, adopted children of God, part of this huge family that God's doing on planet Earth. And the other thing that, the other day where God said yes so powerfully to us was Pentecost. 
The cross had to come before Pentecost so that we would be, there would be a way in which we in our sinful state could be declared holy. Once we were declared holy, and the Spirit in the Old Testament does come on people, could now fill people and live in people. And we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God poured out his spirit at Pentecost. If you believe in him, he pours his spirit into your life and your heart and you become one of his people. So the the, the gospel moves from yes, no to yes in Jesus. All of God's promises are fulfilled in Jesus. And so we can say the amen to God or we can agree together that God is good. And at the heart of it all is Jesus dying for us. Self-giving. Motivated purely and simply to bring this plan of God to action, he died on a cross for us. Each one of us, in his mind in some way, to die for us. So that brings us to ourselves. So we've got yes, no, yes, yes or no. So let's say that together. Yes, no, yes, yes or no. Since Jesus has come, now as we hear the gospel at the various points we do, for me, from my friend Brian, when I was in the Cook Islands. For you, you, you may not remember that if you grew up in a Christian home. You said yes before you can remember saying yes. But at other points along the way, you went to youth camps, you went to children's ministries, you might have been driving a car like my friend who was driving down the Harbour Bridge to kill himself one day because he was so in despair and he reached over uh, and as to change gear and as he did, he bumped his radio and Rima came on and he was saved. This, is, this man now lives in Te Araha, and he's a really important man in the town down there. He became a Christian by bumping the radio onto Rima, going down the, the Harbour Bridge to smash into that concrete at the bottom. So whenever it was for you that you heard the gospel, you had to say yes or no. I think that becoming a Christian is so simple that we can't actually believe it's so simple. We come to understand the story of God. We understand the story of creation, fall, redemption. Yes, no, yes. Relationship, rupture, restoration. Whatever you want to do. I know Ant has taught you some other stuff, right? Whatever it is. Do you mind me calling you Ant? It's cool. (laughs) I've never called you that till today and I was thinking, man, that's a bit familiar. But anyway, whatever whatever way you want to talk about it, our answer at the, the question is, what do we say back to God? Becoming a Christian, I think, is as simple as saying, yes, I want this. Yes. And then the next day we get up and we go, yes. A few days later, we do something sinful. We find ourselves going back to that stuff we shouldn't be back in. We get through it on the other side of it and go, what did I do? Well, I said no for a while. I'm going back to say yes again. Lord, I'm sorry. Yes. Being a Christian is simply... Saying yes, 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 yes. Whoops, I said no, yes. And the beauty of God is those whoops, I said no moments, they don't phase him. They can be whoops, I said no for years in my case, 10 years, when I said to God, I'll follow you when I leave home. I had a vision many years later of God in my life watching me through those years. And I I did some really bad stuff in those years. Not worthy of prison, but they they weren't pleasing to God. And I went like this, put my head in my hands. I said, God, Jesus, you were there. Oh, how embarrassing. And then I realized Jesus was there. He was watching me. He was keeping me and preserving me in those moments when my faith got weak and my yes became a no. And then in my mid-20s, I heard God again and I went, this time I said yes. And from that day on, I've had my moments where all Christian, uh, all Christians are, are weak and never perfect, but for me it's just yes today, Lord. Yes, yes, yes. Not yesterday. That sounded like something else. Anyway, so what I'm trying to describe is what it takes to be a Christian. You don't have to do anything except yield to God and say yes. He's the king of the universe. He's inviting you to join him in his kingdom by the Holy Spirit, and all you do is say yes, and you're in. You're in. And you're there forever as long as you keep saying yes. You might be saying yes in the brokenness of lost relationships, the loss of a loved one who's died, the the pain of hurt as someone has been incredibly nasty to you. I've got a family member at the moment who's dealing with someone who is literally rebelling and nasty to her. But she is not going to take that out on God. She digs deeper into God and goes, yes, yes. 
Help me, Lord, get me through this thing. So I've got yes, no, yes, yes or no. And then it all ends with yes. Whoops, where are we going? Yes. Now this is a bit of a strange one because you would have thought I'd put yes or no. Where God says no to those on his right hand and those to, on his left. So I've got those verses up there. Then the king will say to those on his right, come now. You who are blessed by my father inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Matthew 25, 34. Matthew 25, 41 and 46. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. That looks like God has said yes and no, but actually no. He said yes to what we are, what we said. If we say no, God says, I think through tears, through God, God, God weeps for every image bearer who says no to him. He has to restore his world. They are sent away to eternal destruction. That's why he does it, so that at the end we will have the restoration of the world that you, you spoke of. There, and, and God is being so kind at the moment by delaying that. 2 Peter 3, read 2 Peter 3 very carefully and you'll see to count the patience of, of God as salvation. And that brings us back to us. Our job is to say yes, but to pass that yes on and give opportunity to others. The music of the gospel cannot end up with us in our bedrooms, playing on our guitars, reading our books and our Bibles and not walking out into the world, into workplaces and places and to join in the songs of God to the world. What you have from God is the most wonderful gift, isn't it? We have got to find ways to do it. But what we have to do is put away old patterns of doing it a little bit. There is a time to pull out a tract and go, tell me about Jesus, and you tell that person about Jesus. So I wrote a tract once, but I'd hate to think people just mechanically gave it out. When we know that the moment is there, we give it. There are times in the Bible, which we'll look at later on in December, where that people are told not to. So here's how I'm putting the gospel together today. Yes, no, yes, yes or no, yes. Let's say that together. Yes, no, yes, yes or no, yes. One more. Yes, no, yes, yes or no, yes. Can you remember that? <laughs> You're not sure. Okay. So what should we respond to today? What, 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 what am I asking from you today? Well, the first thing to do is believe it. We all know, and most New Zealanders, bar about 7,000, know that this place didn't spontaneously create itself. They know that there's something more out there because science and everything tells them that, but it doesn't prove who it is. And that's why you've got all these variant religions that have come in from around the world in various combinations. People are consumer spiritualists, they pull bits of it together a lot of Christians are too because they're not founding their, their understanding on this but people are looking for something to believe our job is to believe it let this gospel sink into our spirits day by day as we read the word, as we watch great television shows with Terry and as we study theology if we have the opportunity, whatever it is, find out talk to Anthony and, and Carlos about good books, what's good books I can read so I can feed my soul Fill yourself up with the music of God. Don't become a Christian who thinks, well, I've got it all together because there's new things always to learn. Because as I said to Jane before, you could write a hundred books, a thousand books on Philippians and there's still more there because God's word is an ocean. It's a fantastic thing and we're part of the story. It's fantastic. So believe it and live it. In the Hebrew world, if you believe something and don't live it, you don't believe it. So that's a challenge to me. As I hear that, not just to be a guy who believes it, but to live it. Secondly, know its music more deeply. Immerse yourself in the, the songs of God. Not just the Bible, because the Bible is the heart of everything, but we want to know what's going on in our world so we can understand and discern where God's moving. When we're with our friends, we're listening and we're observing. What, what's God doing in this person? Look for those moments where you can bring God in. And then learn to play it with others so that we can take the gospel to the world. Playing it with others in our church, playing with others in the wider church because we're just one group of people here today. So I really want to encourage you to take the evangelism idea out of the too hard basket and realize that at the most basic level, it's just sitting with someone, listening to them, listening to God, 
the word of God that God is stirring in your hearts and just seeing what comes out. I'll just tell you one little story about a guy at my work. He became a Christian because one day he got a very bad situation at his school where a boy brought a gun to school and was going to shoot him, but one of the other kids saw it. This is in Manurewa, Auckland. One of the kids saw the gun and told the teacher. The, the kid with the gun ran and other teachers ran and it was a really chaotic see, scene. Where the, and then they had to stop this kid killing himself. So one of his friends managed to talk him out of killing himself. So this teacher was so shaken by the event that he was a mess. And I remember just walking up to him outside as I was going home from school that day and I simply put my hand on his shoulder and I said, Dave, God bless you. That's all I said. He comes to me the next day and says, I don't know what happened when you put your hand on my shoulder yesterday, but it was like I was plugged in. I felt nothing. I just accept compassion. See, the gospel is, is it, we think we have to do it in a particular way in the same context every time. No, 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 no. We have to be incredibly good listeners. Ready to share, always ready. 1 Peter 3, we're always ready, but listening and waiting for that prompt, that moment. And sometimes when you're tuned in with God through prayer, and that's why prayer is so important, you say it without even knowing you've said it. Now, isn't that cool? So I really want to encourage you, first of all, today to search your hearts. Do I, have I said yes to God? Are there things that you need to say yes to God to in your own life? Because that's all it takes. And then to dig more deeply into this. Let's, let's pray together.